I'm Scott Al Miller, and this is my life living in Leon, Nicaragua. I get a lot of questions asking for details or some, you know, additional color to the different programs that are available for people who are looking at long-term stay visas, permanent residency visas, here in Nicaragua, specifically the Pensione and the Rentista. These are the two major tools that most people are going to use when they're ready to move past the border run system, and they're looking to formally be able to stay in Nicaragua for a long time. There's a lot of confusion about these, so I want to quickly go over today a few of of the pertinent details that matter for people, especially with that rentista that's a little bit more confusing, right after the bump. There are many programs that you can use to stay long-term in Nicaragua, like with most countries, but there are two that are mostly popular with uh, expats who are looking at staying here in Nicaragua, the Rentista and the Pensione. There's also uh, investment that is well known, but very few people are going to do it because it, it just has much more requirements, takes a lot more time, and uh, really you're making a long-term commitment. That one is really expected that you are all in on Nicaragua, whereas most people are quite serious about staying long term but may not be ready to make that kind of commitment or may not have those kinds of financial resources. It's so it's it's not very popular for a lot of reasons. Basically, anyone who can do that one can also do one of the others. There may be exceptions, but in general, you'll always have multiple open to if you're doing that. So people who are looking at investment visas here in Nicaragua are few and far between and are going to be doing lots of time and a lot of research before they go down that path or certainly should be. This should not be done lightly in any way whatsoever. If it's something you're considering, definitely do not consider looking deeply into that before you're living in the country. Uh, you really need to put in a lot of time and understand a lot of different things far beyond what we can do in this particular video in order to take that one seriously. There's also the uh, visa by marriage, of course. If you're marrying a Nicaraguan, you have a different path to permanent residency and so forth. So let's talk about these two. These are the two that really matter. We're not going to go into every detail. There's lists online and really you want to be talking to a lawyer because there's always the possibility that these things will have changed recently. They have not changed recently at the time that I'm making this video, but that doesn't mean they're not going to change today or tomorrow or the next day. And that's why you always want, it's not required, but if you always want to have a lawyer who knows what they're doing, an actual lawyer who can show you their card that you can look up. There's a verification website online. Make sure you have an authentic Nicaraguan lawyer, not a paralegal, not someone pretending to be a lawyer, not someone who markets to you from abroad. Get here and actually get their, their ID card from the Supreme Court in hand and look it up online before you consider using anyone. But once you have that lawyer, they will be authorized and have access to the information to keep you up to date. And if they say they have to go to immigration and talk to that, it's not how the real lawyers work. They may have to go there for some reason, but they don't have to go there to ask questions. We get a lot of funny stories from people using not real lawyers uh, about how they get their information. So we have these two major systems. What are they? Well, let's start with the pensione. This is the one that most people are familiar with because it is the retirement system. Now, retirement here in Nicaragua only requires that you are 45 years of age. So this is not super old. And I just want to point out, I mention this quite often when we're talking about the pensione, that in order to get the pensione, people say, well, I'm not 45 yet. We get a lot of people who are looking at moving in a kind of early retirement mode to Nicaragua. And they say, well, the pensione is what I want, but I'm too young. Now, most people are not 30 could happen, but it's not common. When you're looking at a retirement visa and an early retirement, generally you're going to be at least 40. And 45 is still a very reasonable number. But it's important to understand that the process of getting your pensione is going to take some time. You could rush it, of course, but you don't need to. So if you're looking at coming down, let's say you're 40, 41 years old, and you want to get the pensione when it's available to you, you can potentially, and there's no guarantees, but you can potentially stall on that without too much of a problem. You can come down and do your border run system. You're retired. You probably have the flexibility uh, to do a lot of different things to hold off having to get that pensione. And of course, you can always file early and just hope for the best, right? You, you're 43. You, you come down at 40. 40, you do border runs until they give you a hard time. You file for your pensione, and the only thing that you're off on is that you aren't 45 yet. What are they going to do? Kick you out of the country? Well, I mean, technically, that's the fear, but chances are 
they're going to come up with some way to let you stay, right? And we're going to talk about the other options that may just cover this for you. It may not matter at all, but they may just delay your paperwork. They may give you, they have the right to say, oh, we're going to let you retire at 43. Of course they can, right? So give them that opportunity. Let your lawyer work with immigration and come up with a plan that makes sense for you. Don't just give up because some technical number doesn't seem like you're meeting the requirement. Maybe you exceed the requirement in some other way. That might be all that matters. Let the government and your lawyer figure this out. They are not in the business of trying to get rid of you. If you are a legitimate retiree looking to, to come to Nicaragua, they legitimately want you. And so everybody involved is going to be looking for a way to get you through that system. Right now, maybe it's going to be some creative thing like doing a different visa, but it's something they're going to be working on your behalf. Right. That's we come to this often with a mindset from like the U.S. and Canada where they're doing as much as they can to limit immigration into the country. But that is not what's going on in Nicaragua. They're trying to encourage immigration into the country at this time. And so the, the whole process is very different than you may be expecting if you've only seen it in some other countries that have very high immigration and are trying their best to slow it down. Now, the pensione, this is meant for those that are going to be retiring. So it's meant for 45 years and older. And the reason that they have a special retirement visa is that it has a lower financial limit than the other visa types, except for marriage. So the current number for the pensione is just $1,000 per month, but it must come from pensions, hence the name. So in Europe, it is common to have pensioners, people who are retired and on a fixed income. Now, qualifying for fixed income includes U.S. Social Security, which you cannot have at 45 in case you're unaware of how America works, but some countries will let you get a pension early. However, for the United States, pensions are a little bit of a problem because Social Security is a unique pension system. And it's not common for American workers to have access to pensions for most things that they do. I've worked many jobs over my career. Never once has one of them offered me a pension. Pensions are most often found with people who are in things like uh, teaching in the public school systems or uh, working for the police force, fire department, other government jobs. They are more likely, but even they're not that likely to have pensions, uh, true pensions as an option. Real pensions have guaranteed payouts. You know, you can say things, and this is where the term fixed income comes from, right? Someone with a pure pension income might be able to go show their paperwork uh, to, to immigration and say, I have exactly $1,843 that is going to be coming in every month. That is guaranteed because it's a pension. And so that's what they're looking for. Now, in practice. I don't believe, and this is my opinion, I do not believe that they will hold you to formal pensions, but the paperwork does say that as far as I am aware. So you need to find something that's going to mimic a pension. So if you have a uh, uh, an annuity or a some kind of uh, uh, dividend that is going to pay in a very predictable way or significantly exceeds the numbers that you need, then you should be able to uh, use that to, to argue. However, it doesn't really matter uh, if you exceed by any much amount. And we'll talk about that in a second. But uh, the whole idea here is that you have an absolute guaranteed $1,000 coming in per month if you are at least 45 years old. So that is, that's what that's for. For people who have pensions that are very small, that are legitimately uh, retired and, and will be able to, I mean, a thousand, you can certainly live in Nicaragua for a thousand. You're not going to be, you know, you're not going to be making it rain every weekend. You're not going to be, you know, renting out baller palaces on the beach uh, all the time and throwing lavish parties, but you can have a very comfortable uh, rental house. You can go get plenty of healthy food and, and pay for your internet and pay for your electric and do all the things of life very easily. I have people on my show who, while they qualify for more, they live on budgets that are smaller, more like $800 per month and say they're pretty comfortable and even have a car, not the latest flashiest car, but they're able to maintain car payments, house payments, rents, whatever, uh, uh, pay for their food and, and travel and do things on that budget. So at $1,000, the Nicaraguan government feels very confident in a retired lifestyle being sustainable without any problem. That is the design of these numbers and these systems, right? They want to make sure that you're able to safely accommodate yourself in the country and be able to cover your expenses and not become a burden on the state. And beyond that, they, they want to welcome you in, right? So that is the design of these systems. That's how to think about it. So that's the pensioners, the pensione visa. That is how it's going to work. And then you can just kind of picture how it's going to work from there. 
Now the Rentista. This is the one that confuses people a lot because there's a lot of misinformation online. And I, this one thing, I don't think it's actually misinformation online. I think it's worded in such a way that people draw a false conclusion from just the way some websites are formatted. Like, it, maybe they're a little bit misleading, but completely accidentally. I've never seen a website that stated. So a lot of the misinformation that people talk about, I have seen sources for it. Like, oh, this thing says you only need $600. I know where that came from. It's false, and I know what its source is, right? In the case case of this particular misinformation, I believe it is legitimate websites with legitimate information that people are reading quickly, or they're seeing like a Google or chat GPT summary that pulls multiple pieces of information and, and garbles it and, and makes it incorrect. So the Rentista visa does not have an age requirement period. There's no age requirement on it. Many websites have the Rentista information listed right next to the Pensione, and it's really easy to see how an AI scraper would merge the two together. A human reading it can decipher that one says that the limitation is only for the Pensione, and then other information is shared between the two. But chat GPT or something would really struggle with that and appears to be doing so. So that's the source. If you hear anyone say you got to be 45 for the Rentista as well, that is absolutely not the case. It is not a retirement plan. It is not meant for people of a certain age. If you are 18 and you otherwise qualify, you can be a Rentista, okay? So that's, that's the first piece. So you can do this at any age. So this is where, potentially, when we said, what if you're too young and, it, you, and you can't just stall through the through the border run system, which you probably can, but in case you can't, the Rentista is available to you. Now, the Rentista is not meant, like we said, for retirees. So it has a higher monetary limit. Instead of bringing in an absolute, completely guaranteed pension of at least 1,000 a month, it is a not guaranteed, but suggestive of being reliable, $1,250 per month. So 25% more income is required. And what I've heard is that you have to show that that has been coming for at least five years. Uh, but we're going to explain a little bit here. So the word rentista is often mistranslated. The direct English translation of rentista is rentier. And I understand that that sounds an awful lot like you derive your income from rents, but that is not what that English word means. Rents do qualify as one of the things that could be meant by the term rentier, but it is not actually implied. It is one of options. It refers to any type of ongoing passive income. And this is important because it could include things like stocks, funds, bonds, you name it. Bonds, you may be able to make an argument for in the pensioners category, but all these different types of what are called passive incomes count for the rentista because a rentier is equally referencing any of those things. So, for example, you have a house in the United States or in Canada, you rent it out and you have a monthly income uh, uh, from that of $2,000 a month. Someone is paying you $2,000 a month to rent that house from you. If that has been going on for five years, right, not, and this is important, right, it is not because it is not a rental agreement that we're talking about. So we're, when we're talking about the rentista or rentier name, it is referring to you as the rentier. So when they say you need five years of income, they don't mean five years of that particular person renting your house. They don't mean that specific contract. It means that your business of renting houses needs to have generated at least $1,250 per month for the last five years, for the last 60 months. And of course, there's probably some flexibility there where you could be like, well, this month it was twice as much, this much it was less, that's how rents work, right? That's probably fine. It's probably an average. It's probably a little bit, you know, that you can explain it. That's how things tend to work here. It's very analog. But it's referring to you as the rentier. So you don't need to show a specific contract. It's not like that because they don't care about rentals. This is not about rentals. It is about your being a business person with passive income, as opposed to pulling a salary uh, to show the same money. Now, if you look at equal things, you could have stocks that pay dividends uh, of, you know, more than twelve fifty per month, and all you have to do is go back uh, sixty months and show that your stocks routinely pay you more than that, at least averaged over that time. Also, no problem at all. Or you could have some rent and some stocks, or some bonds, or some mutual funds, or any number of different business activities that produce dividends or other types of passive payments in excess 
of $1,250 per month. So for people who have things like a retirement account that is not a pension, but is a 401k or an IRA or a Roth IRA, or if you're like me, I didn't use retirement accounts. I used a traditional investment account with no ties to retirement whatsoever so that I would have flexibility throughout my life to make sure I always had access to that money and that has benefits too. And I can go and show that at any time and say, oh, I'd like to be uh, a, a rentista and here is my stock portfolio and here's its performance over the last 60 months. It doesn't matter if you don't take money out of it. You could just have it all sitting in there. So there, you have a guarantee. If you needed that money, that's where it could come from. You could have money come from anywhere you want to actually spend day to day that doesn't matter it's this is all about and it, this is kind of obvious but a lot of people don't stop and think about it everything comes down to the government of Nicaragua wants to know that should you fall on hard times should you lose any form of income that you have going on currently should you have any kind of disaster have that you you become ill and you're unable to work or or the job market dries up whatever they want to know that you have a mechanism that is reasonably reliable nothing can be proven for sure that you can fall back on that is going to guarantee you enough income to live and not become a burden on the state. That is what it all comes down to. So all these things, when you're thinking about it, having that mindset will explain all the things that you're seeing. Now, where get, you can be a little bit creative with the rentista that you can't with the pensione, because the pensione officially requires like official pension mechanisms to qualify as a purely fixed income. But rentista is much more flexible, especially if you're coming from someplace like the United States, where we have much more flexible business ownership. So in the United States, it is common for people people, especially those who work online, to not work directly uh, for the company that they're working for, but to form their own corporation and be a contractor. Now, I know some people don't understand how these things work. They don't form a corporation. They just act as a contractor. And that creates a lot of problems. But even then, you can make an argument for your salary coming from that for being uh, in the rentista, because in the United States, salaries, when they're paid to you as a contractor, you're also a sole ownership that is simply not registered. So technically it kind of qualifies. So I would not want to go down that path if I could help it. But if you were in a position where you had to speak with your lawyer and work out a plan, you can probably present that in a reasonable way. But for those who have a little bit more wherewithal, have been planning a little bit longer or simply have the infrastructure in place, having a business that you hire yourself through generally takes care of everything you need. Now, if you have like a class C corporation, that may not always. You may be paying yourself a salary and have no claims to passive income unless your stocks are also making a certain amount of money. But you also may be able to maneuver that with your lawyer and figure things out, right? There's options. But what you're able to do with most types of uh, investments of your own, let's say you own a, a restaurant in the United States or you, you're, you're a contractor and you've made a business for selling your own services. And this is easy, right? When I worked on Wall Street, uh, the top performing people were not paid through the internal HR mechanisms because they had, they had income caps. So people who needed to earn above the income, the official HR income caps would have to be contractors. And then they had no caps and they could pay whatever your market value was. So, so the top, you know, one, two percent of the people working within the bank were kept as contractors. So when you were a contractor, you always had the option of forming your own company instead of just taking the pay directly. You could form a company, have that be paid, and then that company can do whatever it wants with that money, including it could pay you with it, but it could also pay you through uh, um, uh, dividends at the end of the year. It could take the money before it comes to you and use it to invest in other things, start other businesses or whatever, just general business accounting practices. But these are things that contractors often do in the United States, but they don't normally think about all the flexibilities that would come with it because they don't need them. They're just looking for a way to maybe run payroll before they get paid to make taxes a little bit easier, something like that. But if you're doing something like that, so you have a business, let's just say you're a graphic designer, and you, even if you only work for one client, that's fine, but if you work for 10, that's fine too. All these different ways will work. You can bring in that money and pay yourself as a dividend. What's interesting is that with certain types of classifications, depending on where you've incorporated, certain LLCs, when, when declared as an S-Corp, are able to pay salary and dividends as a merged thing. They, they appear the same. This gives you an opportunity to show that you're being paid through dividends and it's actually your salary or vice versa, or it's really dividends. It's all in how you look at it. It becomes a semantic argument. But by having a company that can say, these are dividends, here's what is being dispersed. And even if the company is just you, that's 
blind outside the United States. That's not something that's discoverable. Of course, the U.S. government knows all about it because it's a U.S. company. But outside the United States, it is simply a company and it is paying you dividends. So you, there are paths for most people. Now, if you're just a standard employed person somewhere and you're just pulling a salary, you're going to need to go and work with your lawyer and, and make an argument for qualifying for the rentista. It should not be a problem. There are also some digital nomad accommodations that are new and special. So you may want to go down that path as well. I'm not familiar with what those offerings are. I know of no person who's ever bothered to go in that path because there's all these other systems that allow you to be a digital nomad. And every person I've ever known has qualified for at least one of them, if not normally two or three. So it's, it's generally not a, a problem. But uh, if you have any form of your own investments, whether it's traditional stocks or your own business that you do work through, or it truly is passive, generally you can maneuver that into a passive income that will exceed the requirements for the country. Now, you may not have the longevity, but again, the longevity rules are not that it's a single entity paying you for that long, just that you've had those transactions over a period of time. So you may show currently that you have uh, a business that perhaps you own that you're getting that passive income from, even if it kind of mirrors a salary. But in the past, maybe you can show that it was coming from an investment account or something like that, a, an S&P index fund like we talk about sometimes. All those things will qualify. You just have to work with your lawyer, package them and present them in the right way to show that it is what you need. Now, again, the number is $1,250 per month. So you do have to hit that. Generally, people who are working in any way in the United States or Canada won't have a problem coming up to that number, at least averaged over a period of time. So very important when you're looking at the rentista. In no way does it imply you have to be doing rental properties. It is your personal business of you putting together numbers as an average over the period of time to show that your income is at that level. Uh, and only if you're under 45 and don't have the pension system to qualify for the even easier pensions, uh, pensioner, uh, pensione system. Now, I say easier. It's easier if you have those things. If you don't have those things, of course, it's really hard because you can't magically make yourself over 45 and you can't magically get a pension. Pensions are not open to the public. So that's one of the reasons why the rentista is super important because anyone can put together a rentista system if they have time and plan ahead. But a pensione, you have to have taken a career that specifically offered a pension, put in decades and come up with a pension large enough to qualify. So it's very complex. Thanks for joining me. Like and subscribe. Get down and ask any questions you have. Uh, always love when people write in, give me stuff to talk about. And of course, we love it when you guys send in a video of yourself. We have a join button. That's for joining our membership system. It's $5 per month, and it's just a monthly ongoing commitment to help support the channel. It really does help. We have so many expenses, and it makes a big difference. And of course, if you just want to do a one-time sponsorship, you can buy me a coffee or a few at the link above, buymeacoffee.com slash Scott Allen Miller. We don't sell anything on the channel. We don't have some program that you pay to get extra access to all of our information is completely free, completely available to the public. And it is absolutely 100% through your donations and the tiny bit of ad revenue, which is so much less than you would imagine coming in is where all of our uh, ability to keep the lights on comes from. So we really appreciate everyone who helps make this channel uh, possible. Thanks for joining me. I'll see all of you tomorrow.